Well, welcome everyone to our AI Institute webcast, AI in Investment. We are so happy to have you here. Um, bonjour tout le monde. So this webcast will be recorded and you can provide your questions in both French and English using the chat function. I'm excited to announce our host today, Moko Aljoa, who is our AI strategy leader here at Deloitte. Over to you, Moko, to kick, up, Just, kick us off for this session. Thank you, Aisha, uh, and welcome everybody. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Thank you for joining Deloitte AI Institute Canada for today's panel discussion on AI and investment management. I'd like to begin with Atlantic acknowledgement. While this event is a webcast, I would uh, I would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the lands we are on today. Deloitte Canada has offices with representation across most of the country. We acknowledge that our offices reside on traditional treaty and unceded territories as part of Turtle Island and is still home to many First Nations Métis and Inuit peoples. Um, let's begin our session today with a bit of a preamble on what you can expect to, to hear uh, with a macro view of why this is such an important topic uh, in the market and for this audience in particular. The operating environment for investment management firms worldwide continues to undergo rapid transformation as industry challenges intensify. We're seeing volatility in the market and the capital markets returns and fee and margin compression altering the dynamics of the sector. In this shifting paradigm, technology continues to play a critical role in enabling rapid business transformation, as well as driving opportunities for efficiencies, innovation, and value creation. Many investment management firms have taken note and are addressing some of the key areas uh, that are causing this volatility. There's market volatility, certainly, that requires the need for efficient decision-making under changing market conditions. Secondly, you're seeing an increased use and interest in private market data. And more broadly, there's an evolving regulatory landscape, shifting policies, uh, including ESG and, and uh, use and, and privacy and sharing of data factored into investment decisions. There's a number of examples and use cases that support these, uh, these macro trends. But if we go to the next page and talk about these four specific trends in investment management that are really shaping um, a lot of the innovation and, and new ideas, uh, really powering the growing importance for firms to make bold decisions um, and offering potential for transformation and value creation. So four key trends I'll quickly tree top as we set the stage for this dynamic conversation of AI and investment management. The first one is around generating alpha. Based on our survey in 2022, uh, where we conduct an investment management industry outlook reaching uh, thousands of respondents across the globe, an overwhelming majority of our survey respondents, 85% respondents uh, said uh, who use AI-based solutions in the pre-investment phase, either strongly agreed or agreed that AI helped them generate alpha. Nearly three-fourths of the respondents said that they would increase their budget for alpha generating technologies such as AI, NLP, NLG, and alternative data over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, as an example, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, and as recently has set up a new center dedicated to research in AI. Uh, that's the Black Lab, BlackRock uh, Lab for Artificial Intelligence. Another example would be Man Group, one of the pioneers in using AI and alternative data to support alpha generation. They made AI a corner, cornerstone of their strategy, and, and they've surged their AUM by 77% in less than four years in the late um, 2015 to 2018 period. Um, that's an interesting sort of um, set of uh, trends that are shaping this, this topic around generating alpha with the use of alternative data and AI. The second major trend I'd like to point out is around enhancing efficiency and operational efficiency. Um, the Aladdin engine that many of you will be familiar with uh, by BlackRock creates 1 million daily risk and exposure reports for portfolio managers, improving uh, the management of risk. Other AI operational use cases include surveillance, data cleansing, and support functions. Um, Third trend I'll talk about is around improving product and content distribution. This is an area where um, a company uh, may introduce partners or allow advisors to assess client portfolios against individual goals and risk appetites, as well as make buy or sell recommendation based on proprietary algorithms. UBS has, has been leading the charge in this area as an example and, and partnered with a number of uh, organizations to help run millions of portfolios through their models and advisors receiving actionable investment proposals for every client. And then finally, in the space of managing risk, we know this is a, a, of deep importance to 
organizations to bolster compliance and risk management functions and conduct automated data analysis and reduce the administrative burden associated with managing risk. Um, organizations are looking at incorporating internal trade data into existing market liquidity models, as well as applying machine learning techniques here to more accurately calculate the cost of redemptions and gauge liquidity risk as an example. Those are some examples and just wanted to set the stage because a lot of our, our esteemed panelists today that I'm gonna be introducing in a minute will we'll cover some of these areas and, and share what is working, what's not working and what's top of mind for them. A brief look at the value chain. Uh, if you're exploring opportunities uh, of leveraging AI in, in asset management, investment management, if you go to the next page, you will see that there's a number of proof points in the market across the entire value chain from acquisition to portfolio management to asset administration. And how do asset managers, investment managers tap into these opportunities and what capabilities are coming to the forefront Here's a bit of a summary a sheet on that. Um, the biggest development in stakeholder expectations for investment management firms is related to ESG and data processing. That'll certainly be a topic we will explore more deeply in today's conversation. So have your questions handy. Uh, investment management firms are processing new data sets with AI to meet customer ESG priorities and investment return expectations at the same time. Another example here would be uh, AI-enabled scenario analysis and portfolio stress testing to optimize decision-making based on market dynamics and risk assessment. In these volatile markets, looking at those sort of capabilities around scenario analysis and stress testing uh, becomes critically important to, to manage decision-making. NLP-enabled investment research to incorporate both unstructured information and data and alternative data into decision-making while enhancing efficiency is another key theme, our example that is being now increasingly adopted by investment management firms. We know that investment management, asset management is a highly relationship-oriented business. So firms that engage with their clients really excel. So from our esteemed panelists, we will explore how they have mitigated these risks and are succeeding in a shifting landscape. Let's do a quick poll before I introduce you to our panel. The poll question will pop up and the question is, how are you applying AI to investment management today? And you can pick one or multiple options. Uh, let's take a minute to, to get your input here. And if you see your option that is not listed in this poll, we'd really love to hear in the chat function, um, what else you're using uh, AI to apply to investment management? So I see a few people who have selected others. So please um, enter your, your comments in the chat just so we can all collectively see how it is being applied. Okay, I'm gonna just end the poll and share results. And uh, what are your thoughts so far in, in, in seeing these results, Michael? Yeah, it looks like there's a, there's a healthy mix of optimization and execution of investment strategies, but balancing that with risk management and operational efficiency. So that, that resonates, that, that speaks to some of the examples and some of the investments we just outlined as a table setter for today's conversation. And increasingly as, investment management firms look into performance, portfolio performance analytics and marketing distribution servicing. There's a, there's a vast array of opportunity to further exploit that once some of the foundational use cases and opportunities are addressed that really uh, speak to alpha generation and operational efficiency. So really fascinating. I, I too would love to hear uh, others that have been added on here. The 17% and other is, is uh, really interesting to explore because this is these are some categories and themes. There's always new ideas and new opportunities popping up uh, from the innovation teams and technology teams across asset managers. So we'd love to hear uh, what else we are seeing through the other. So please, please enter those in the in the chat and, and our Q and A, and we'll discuss that further. Well, without further ado, I might um, introduce our panelists for today's conversation. Uh, let's start with um, Alex Sokolov. Go to the list. Yeah. All right, Alec, uh, he's co-founder and CEO of SR.AI. Uh, he's building AI-powered solutions for socially responsible investors using AI-based NLP technologies to distill and summarize all relevant information in a streamlined, uh, concise, and interactive format. That's SR.AI. But Alec's experience spans the field of finance and AI 
in industry and in academia. He spent six years previously at Deloitte Consulting. So welcome back to this conversation, Alec. Good to see you uh, as a machine learning team lead and, and uh, several years at Mithril Capital as a VC investor. He's an accomplished researcher, having published works to, on applying deep learning to financial time series, as well as for ESG investing. Alec is also active in the academic world as an instructor at the University of Toronto's Masters of Mathematical Finance program as a researcher and PhD candidate on the AI of finance at the U of T. So welcome, Alec. Um, Ari Shannon. Ari is responsible for PSP's digital innovation and private market solutions team, which includes everything impacting emerging technologies in asset management, testing use cases jointly with business units and scaling vi viable solutions that create value. So really at the heart of how businesses are experimenting and evolving and generating new capabilities and value. Before starting at PSP, Ari worked for four years at the Boston Consulting Group, most recently as a project lead, where he developed digital strategies for some of the largest corporations in the world and in Canada, including in the financial sector. He holds an MBA from Tuck Business School and a Bachelor of Engineering from McGill University. Welcome, Ari, to the discussion. And finally, Jonathan Simpkins. Jonathan Simpkins is our, uh, as a partner at Deloitte Canada and leads our investment management practice and consulting with past experience across multiple different professional services firm and industry, Jonathan brings a unique vantage point looking at global and Canadian investment management trends and practical practicalities of making these ideas and opportunities across business analytics and technology in the investment management uh, uh, sector real. So welcome, Jonathan. And finally, last but not least, Audrey Ancion. This discussion will be led and moderated by uh, Audrey Ancion, many of you would have met her before as our Deloitte AI Institute Canada leader. Uh, she, she is um, an expert facilitator and moderator. We'll make sure this is an interesting and provocative conversation for the audience. So please keep your questions coming and, and be sure to raise any ideas, uh, any areas that we must explore with this, uh, with this panel. With that introduction, Audrey, over to you to take it away. Thanks so much, Mukul. A true pleasure to be here uh, together with a um, tech startup founder, a seasoned professional in, a, in a, at a pension plan, as well as a uh, experienced consultant investment management to talk about how AI is being applied in this space. So um, really looking forward to also hearing your questions for our panelists for um, uh, what are both the, be the risks and benefits of AI, but also um, how it's being done. Um, what are the success factors for truly driving adoption? Uh, so keep your questions coming. Um, let's start with you, Ari. I would love to understand how at PSP Investment, you are seeing AI deliver some concrete value. Can you talk to us about some of the uh, concrete, tangible use cases that you've been able to, to drive and implement at PSP? Yeah, happy to, and, and thanks for that introduction and uh, and everything so far. I think uh, what we're doing at PSP fits very nicely in what, uh, what you're already describing here so far. Uh, so in just a quick background of, uh, of my role, and, and I think it'll make sense for a second of how we're applying AI, it's, it's we're looking across our different asset classes uh, and total funds as well um, to try to figure out where it is that AI could drive the most value across the full value chain. And so part of the job is actually to figure out um, what is the benefit of it? You know, or is it small incremental uh, wins or are we talking about major wins? Uh, and then secondly, to actually uh, prove out the feasibility if, uh, if, if it's you know, even possible to actually get these models to do what we think we could get them to do. And then lastly, are investors actually gonna use this and can we make investment decisions with it? Um, so we've really looked across of what my last four years at PSP, um, almost everywhere in private markets, uh, private equity, uh, credit investment. Uh, we've looked at our real estate team. Uh, we worked with our natural resources team, um, and then all the way over to our public markets team and our uh, total funds, uh, essentially our, our asset allocators uh, team as well. Uh, where we're seeing the most success, and I guess uh, that's, that's quickly getting at the heart of, of what, what you're looking for, uh, is to have no surprise, it's where we see the highest quality data and the highest volume data uh, to be able to actually build our models off of. 
Um, in the private space, it's actually mostly on the fund side. Uh, private equity funds, uh, it's actually a pretty, you know, that, that's, they have a long history of uh, being around uh, with a ton of data since about the 1980s. And, and a lot of that data is becoming more and more available now through third party providers quite seamlessly. Um, on the public market side, of course, there's there's really no uh, no shortage of, of data, and, and actually the, the the challenge more on the public market side, of course, is to actually decide where you want to focus your resources because there's just an infinite number of of uh, like models to build or, or challenges to tackle that AI could definitely address. So it's which ones are going to actually have the most impact in uh, uh, with the actual investments we make. Um, and we're seeing from that standpoint, uh, we're seeing it actually in, um, in, in forecasting and in, in trying to be able to forecast how individual names, uh, individual equities uh, around the world are, are gonna perform in, in coming quarters. Uh, and I could talk more about that uh, later if that's interesting. And then um, on the total fund side, we're also looking at that from an allocation standpoint, uh, how basically we could optimize the way that the pension fund allocates our essentially almost 250 billion in, in assets across our different asset classes. There's, there's uh, a lot of different techniques that we could think about applying to that allocation process as well. So, sounds great. Thank you, Ari. And uh, wondering um, if you could talk to us about your team a little bit and to bring those use cases to life. Uh, some people say it takes a village. What does that look like at PSP? What's your, uh -huh. your philosophy and, and approach to building uh, impactful data science or machine learning team? <laughs> village for sure. Uh, maybe easier to do it through collaboration. That's uh, That's been sort of our path. So we have a small core team, um, about uh, 12, 10, 12 to 15 people. Um, I'd say a, a third of which are data scientists, a third of which are um, management consulting backgrounds, uh, profiles, uh, essentially uh, project, complex project leaders, uh, and then a third of which are uh, software designers. Uh, and then in addition to that, every project we would take on um, would heavily involve the investors uh, or, or whatever business unit or asset class we're working with, uh, we'll, we'll, to the point where we have joint teams, literally dedicated people, dedicated analysts, uh, managers, uh, directors, managing directors uh, to the project uh, where we'll you know, sort of collaborate on a weekly basis, uh, weekly workshops and uh, build these solutions together. Uh, doing it just one team in isolation uh, would I find it would almost be near impossible in this scenario, given the deep expertise you need in the investing world to be able to understand performance of assets and how you actually create value or by investing. Um, it's really a collaboration play. So you need some internal resources, uh, but you really have to find the right model that you could work with the rest of your business with to, to deliver value. Sounds good. Thanks for that, Ari. Um, I would love to turn it over to now you, Alec, uh, from SR.AI. Um, we've spoken about some examples of use cases with Ari, like forecasting. Um, what are some examples of applied AI or applied uh, natural language processing that you're seeing and that you may be driving as well? Absolutely. Um, and Ari, I, I, like the framing you you had around asset classes and and to add to that another useful way i think to frame a ai use case in investment management is around what is uh what's oftentimes colloquially referred to as ai these days right deep learning algorithms versus other machine learning techniques technologies etc uh, generally speaking in investment management deep learning really shines for collecting or creating new data Right. So this is structuring, you know, uh, text data with natural language processing like we do. Right. Or working with satellite industry imagery using computer vision techniques, for example. Um, on the other hand, once that data is structured and turned into a format um, that investment managers have been working on the quantitative side for, you know, decades now, generally speaking, more traditional methodologies will still reign supreme. There's also an interesting peculiarity in, in investment management specifically where because signals, signal to noise ratios are so high and because the, the industry is so competitive, what Ari also mentioned around how much background knowledge is required to do this work well is, is very, very important. And, and this, this 
um, persists across asset classes, no matter what you look at. It generally doesn't work to sort of throw the kitchen sink at the problem, as you can in many other uh, domains um, or applications, right? When especially when it comes to buy side, you really need that human knowledge in, in injected into whatever machine learning techniques are developed, right? And this is where deep learning really becomes isolated to creating data because it tends to be so black boxy, it's difficult to make a tradable strategy out of deep learning techniques, even if something does perform well, because it's difficult to inject that real world knowledge into these algorithms. Um, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, when it comes to ESG, we do see a lot of opportunity for using deep learning because ESG has a lot of known data gaps. Right. So what Asari does with natural language process processing is very impactful. Uh, but on the other hand, where I think we'll also see a big evolution in the coming years, and th this isn't really as futuristic as it sounds, is a lot of computer vision technologies as well for 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 ESG. Right. Monitoring, you know, physical assets and emissions um, at those locations, for example, is something that's becoming very much realistic given recent advances in both satellite imagery uh, cost effectiveness and in deep learning technologies and their own cost effectiveness as well. And I, I think we'll see a lot more of that kind of thing as well, just closing these data gaps in much more of a real time and much more of a detailed way. Um, so Alex, thanks for, for uh, highlighting uh, and, and clarifying some terms really helpful here. Um, wondering if you can, um, Jonathan, help us complement um, this discussion with also your view of what you're seeing investment organizations here in Canada, but also globally, um, how are they using machine learning? Um, what are you seeing? Sure, um, I'm trying to, trying to kind of build on what Ari and Alec have, have covered. Um, I think one of the things that was most, most surprising to me at the start and this might be just kind of reflective of the markets changing over the last kind of six to 12 months, um, was just how high operational efficiency was in the use cases. I think when generally I've been looking at this in the past, I think everyone has been so focused on alpha generation for the past kind of five to seven years, that that's where all the use cases and focus has been because that's where the, the um, opportunity was. Whereas now I think what we're starting to see is actually there's more value in trying to drive some efficiencies. So I think that was a really interesting insight for me. Um, so, and then in terms of the generating alpha, that is where the use cases have been. Um, so, and it's, it is asset class specific as, as Ari said, uh, but in the public markets, generally it's increasing the amount of proprietary models that are being applied to the future of future performance of securities. Um, but I would definitely agree that the majority of the use cases that we've seen have been in private markets where um, the data quality and availability is at a premium. Um, and, and there's a couple of, uh, well, one example now that I just want to cover, which is generally around in private equity um, and the use of AI within portfolio companies. Um, it's very easy to kind of sift through the PL and try to make some decisions. But actually, if you can use AI um, for the, to identify some of the optimization opportunities, um, then that's generally where we've seen it. Um, and also supporting the identification of operational efficiencies. Um, through the data that generally um, underpins the, the management reporting. Um, so that's definitely kind of a use case in private equity to, try, to drive the value creation. Um, going on next is um, the client experience side, um, which I've generally seen with more of the, the asset managers because it's, like, it's that cross-section of, of investment management and wealth management with the wholesalers and the advisors working together. Um, but they have different and unique uh, data sets so they, it's not possible to bring them together, unfortunately, yet, um, but uh, mainly for competition reasons. Um, but actually, if they can use the output from their respective data sets, and then it's how can you determine what the optimum product is for the end investor? Um, so, so we've started to see that really drive kind of how do you bring the right um, product to, your, uh, to the investor. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, all three of you have give, given us some ideas for um, the what, um, how AI is being applied for what kind of use case. I'd love to turn to the how. Um, so in our latest investment outlook survey, 85% of our respondents said, yes, we're going to invest more in AI. 85% said we're increasing our budgets. But when we asked about adoption, um, the 67% of organizations are facing tremendous challenges in adopting AI. Uh, 
for example, this compares to 58% for cybersecurity and 54% for cloud computing. So it does sound like AI is one of the most difficult technologies out there to implement and, and ensure successful adoption. So we'd love to hear your perspective on what makes it so hard and, and what makes it so hard in investment management and wondering if there are lessons learned um, for others and potentially lessons learned from other sectors that we can bring in. Um, let's start with you, Ari. Why is it so hard? Do you agree with the 60% uh, that it is tough? <laughs> Yes, I definitely agree that it's tough and uh, maybe it's good, I don't know if, uh, maybe the reason I, I'm in my spot and I've got a job and if my team has a job is just, uh, we think it is really hard and actually I think you really do need some dedicated um, people thinking about that in any organization that's really uh, actually serious about implementing uh, more AI use cases and experimenting with it. I think you do need to get serious and build a serious team around it because um, those challenges are real. Uh, there's a host of them. Uh, I think it's a long list. I could pick from a few uh, to actually talk about here, but but the truth is that there really are a lot of small things because it's it's a big change. Um, let's say the the three biggest ones that I'm seeing are actually if you go across the the, the different phases of actual implementation. If you think about it, uh, first when you're actually just starting to build the model originally or, or even the idea of it, uh, the data is always, you know, number one concern and issue. Uh, you need really well-structured data. And if it's not that well-structured, if you're starting with unstructured data, then you still need it to be of extremely high quality because uh, once the quality starts to break down, especially at the input, uh, it, once you get towards the output of that model, it, it almost becomes meaningless. So you have to make sure you have really high quality data going in. And if you're using structured data, really well-structured and normalized data. And that itself could take months to just get there. Um, the second is around um, getting the input, as I was talking about, the collaboration and, and wherever you're working, if you're working in, um, uh, let's say, public markets or, or private equity, uh, wherever you're working, you need to make sure that you have the input of the people who have been doing this for the last 20 years uh, to make sure that you that that their understanding of the way assets generate returns and values created and 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 P and Ls are built, that the model is reflecting that. It, it it's nice to, and and I think this is the ingoing hope that everybody even even the most hopeful uh, people have when when starting AI projects. Hey, we're going to learn something new and 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 AI is going to teach us something and teach us something about investing and show us uh, maybe returns we never even knew were on the table and sort of, you know, point the spotlight on, on dark areas we didn't even know really existed for opportunities. Uh, but often that's not the case. Sometimes it's true and it's true in, in, in places, but often you do need a lot of the existing institutional expertise to guide, uh, guide your model, to make sure the model is actually making sense and, and uh, maybe processing the feature data features in the right way uh, and maybe actually uh, like sort of developing its outputs in the right way and actually guard railing it. So that's another very important step um, and one that, that doesn't always get done properly. Um, and then the last one, just purely about adoption and literally using it on a day-to-day -day basis is that requires, of course, a mindset shift. And, and really, it's it's from the top of the organization. That's how we feel it here. Uh, definitely from, from the CEO, from the way uh, they talk about uh, the use of data, the use of analytics in, in our everyday processes, uh, but as well from managing directors within um, within different asset classes. They need to, to sort of reinforce on, on their teams that this is an extra tool you should be using and, and uh, it's okay to experiment a little bit and it's okay to move away from the way we've always been doing things in the past uh, and really encourage it because without that encouragement it's it's much easier to just use existing tools existing processes and pay less attention to new insights coming from different models thanks Ari. you you've highlighted the data challenge which uh, i think we're all facing uh none of us are working with perfect and perfectly structured and available data um, AI is, is not a magic box, right, that you can just drop without human context and knowledge and that does its thing on its own. You've got to uh, proactively uh, build in that uh, input and the, the mindset. It also requires, requires a mindset shift. Um, Alec, anything to add to those, those considerations, those challenges? You're on mute. There's a couple things that come to mind. Thanks, Audrey. Um, so 
one side of it, I think, is just economics of certain problems. Like in general, as the level of sophistication increases, the time required, for example, to generate you know alternative data in house using te you know technologies like natural language processing and our computer vision uh, becomes quite high, right? And even for the largest funds, it, it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily make sense to to do that themselves, right? So buying or partnering becomes very very important. The other side of buying and partnering, though, is that there's a lot of information asymmetry because asset management is uniquely context driven, right? It's, you know, it's probably one of the industries where where knowledge of the industry is the most important, right? Even when it comes to, you know, doing technical work. Um, I think the today the overlap between people who know, you know, cutting edge AI and machine learning technologies and understand the asset management world well is very, very small. And again, that's where I think part, partnering becomes very, very important to bring some of those skill set in-house. But if you just sort of leave the machine machine learning people in a vacuum to create products for asset management, then they might not create something that, that is operationalizable. Um, and then another consideration too is, is funneling, right? So for the most part, when, when folks think about applying machine learning technologies, I think there are, there are things that are a lot more, ob you know, use cases that are a lot more obvious than others, right? So therefore, there's a lot of competition on the AI machine learning side, for example, within listed equities, right? And in private markets, I think a lot of use cases are underexplored. Uh, moreover, I think a lot more opportunities exist today on the, on the fundamental investing side to enable the fundamental investors with better tooling that that uses AI technologies, right? Rather than sort of everybody funneling into listed equities and everybody funneling into into quant you know quant strategies when it when it comes to machine learning efforts. I think there's a lot of re respectively lower hanging fruit in other asset classes on the fundamental side compared to the quantitative side using these same technologies. Thanks, Alec. Jonathan, what is your take on what the impediments are to AI adoption in investment management? Yeah, sure. So I think it's going to be building on, on some of what Ari said. Um, but in terms of the impediment, I think the largest one is, um, and these aren't mutually, ex mutually exclusive, but I think data governance um, is a huge part of this. So um, st establishing not only acceptance, but ownership of data within the front office um, is an ongoing challenge. Um, so despite significant demand for data from the investors, the maintenance and the clean cleansing of data is often considered someone else's problem, um, which can often be addressed through a strong and common data culture um, throughout an organization. Uh, the next one, um, and this leads nicely on, is data quality. Um, without the requisite governance and, and the strong culture, which I just referenced, um, there's a lack of data quality often leads to disagreements in the output of any AI and, and general uses of data. Um, and nothing, frankly, nothing will stop an AI program quicker than a question mark over, over its output. Um, so I think it's really important to have those things in place before proceeding um, to anything around AI. Um, Thanks and for then, that. Sorry. And then, and then the final one is, is just cost. Um, so not only the cost to successfully address the two things I've just mentioned, um, but also the broader setup of an AI capability um, but then also the competition and therefore cost of data science resources, especially in Canada, um, which is at a premium, especially with the tech companies using US balance sheets um, to pay salaries, which cause issues making many investment management business cases viable. Thanks for those three I, points, I Jonathan. Can... Ari, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to add on to what, what Jonathan I was saying, I think that's a great one that I didn't touch on, but maybe it would be number four on my list, if not, it could easily be bumped up in there, which is the cost. And I think you tied that well to talent, talent uh, to, to have, to, to, to even to, um, uh, to recruit talented data scientists on our team. And, and when we do our, our um, business cases for any, any use case that we're considering, um, so much of it is experimental and so much of it is okay if it works this is going to be a year or two out by the time we uh, finish the experimentation scale it uh, develop the, the right data pipelines to it uh, and then make sure that it actually works you know by sort of like live testing it for a little bit alongside Th these are long-term investments on experimental projects with very high uh, highly uh, touted and recruited uh, individuals so you put all that together and that in itself is is a major challenge and you really maybe go back to the mindset and the belief it, it does require a bit of a leap forward mm -hmm. to make those investments make those recruitments um, to be able to even start the journey 
uh, thank you both for highlighting that talent dimension. Um, we have a question from uh, one of the, the participants. In your view, do the investment management firms have the right data infrastructure to be able to generate the right normalized data for future implementation of AI to their business? Wondering if um, any of you could comment on that or what your perspectives are. Yeah, I, I, I can I can start. Um, so, I mean, I could talk specifically, I mean, about PSP, but but even you know our uh, many discussions with my peers in similar spots across other Canadian pension funds. Um, I think we're all working from a pretty solid base. I, I think pension funds are obviously, and, and most investors are, are quite good at tracking their own transactions uh, and decision making. And that's that's a large part of the um, uh, importance of of, of just being solid investor is actually tracking exactly how you came to that decision and why and the data behind it. So that's actually captured pretty well. Uh, the one thing we find though is for a lot of our use cases, uh, oftentimes you wanna use data in a different way and, and you sort of need, it, need these steps of transformation. It's rarely, I find it's rarely comes in the, in the structure or, the, um, or, or even the full data set that we need. Oftentimes we're combining databases or, or, or buying new data or adding to it. So I think the foundation is, is generally pretty good at a lot of, a lot of uh, our peers, us and our peers. Uh, but again, the reality is given the use cases that I think a lot of people are going after, you talked about alpha, but even for efficiencies, um, a lot of times you do need to manipulate that data. So there's still some work to do. Thanks, Ari. Uh, Alec Jonathan. Um, I, I would add, I think outside of the pension world, it, it can it can be hit and miss, right? And I, I think certain asset managers sometimes do have a tendency to build certain things in house um, that aren't re really uh, like aren't really strategic or a competitive advantage, right? And the sort of are, are nowadays finding themselves in a place where certain um, not even necessarily data engineering activities, but for example, certain certain back office functions right, are, are built in house when really it's something that that has been commoditized mm -hmm. um, and, and would have been you know, more natural to, to, to buy. Thanks for that point, Alec. Jonathan, anything to add on um, either like the data architecture or would love to also have your perspective on what investment management can learn from other industries, uh, if possible, uh, for how to drive further AI adoption or how to drive it in a purposeful manner? Sure. Um, so I think, I think the first one I was going to say in terms of normalization, there are a lot of data sets out there. Um, and I think most of them are generally accepted, but I think the, I, as we said earlier, and the one that's constantly struggling because you're getting lots of data from different resources and there isn't an industry standard is private markets data. The frequency, what the fields are, fields are coming through, it's very, very difficult to standardize that. And that's going to remain a challenge um, for the foreseeable future. Um, but understanding how you would like to normalize internally and then sticking to that is how you can, how you can pr proceed. In terms of learning from other industries, I think, and I'm, I'm gonna probably have quite a theme coming through the things I say, but I think this, this concept of a data culture and actually accepting that data is part of everybody's job. It's, not, it's no longer an administration job. It is the job of the people who want to use the data to make sure that they're maintaining the data and keeping the data clean. Um, yes, there's managed services for, for some of the vendors, and that can be helpful because they know the data models better than everyone. But unless you have a response, acceptance of responsibility, um, which we see in other industries, um, then you are going to struggle to move forward with this in a meaningful way. Thanks for that, Jonathan. And I wonder, Ari and Alec, if um, you could share examples from your respective organizations or others around how to build that data culture. It doesn't come overnight. Um, it's built from the top. Uh, what's your experience in, in how to do this well, how to build that data culture? Uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet, at least for not for us. Uh, like I, I do, I, I mentioned it before, and I, I do think it's a major component is the mindset shift and the, and especially from the leadership uh, within the organization. Uh, it's been about two, three years now that our CEO has been talking about data-driven decision making, and, and that being one of the priorities um, as as PSP moves forward uh, that, that we need to develop capabilities around. 
Uh, so that definitely helps. Um, and then I do actually think, you know, being, uh, we do a lot of internal presentations of, um, of some of the projects working on, but also just sort of knowledge share on, on what we're seeing in uh, trends in NLP or, or, or other trends in, in general in AI and neural nets and, and, and in investing. And so we'll, we'll talk about that quite vocally and try to have two ways discussions on it. Uh, that type of stuff helps to just sort of raise awareness, raise the topics, um, and, and kind of just like keep um, keep keep the the interest high. Because I think uh, I think as long as once once the overall organization gets more interested in how we're going to use uh, data AI to, to actually improve, whether it's investments or even as we're talking about before efficiencies, um, I think that's where you start to really start to see momentum in certain areas. You're right, uh, not a silver bullet to build a data culture and definitely a multifaceted uh, approach necessary. Um, Alec, any any other words on data uh, culture? Yeah, I, I would add silos to that as well. Um, mm -hmm. Asset management firms do tend to be more siloed than I, I think even a, a lot of other industries, right? And some asset management firms even have a culture of keeping uh, as teams uh, that, that deal with particular asset classes or even desks within the same asset class, very, very separate, um, right? And, and that kind of culture can create a lot of data silos naturally, right? So it, it that goes to uh, data governance, right? It even goes to exchange of investment ideas in general, right? Like there is a lot of um, benefit to cross-pollinating both data and investment ideas across asset classes. And a lot of times, you know, to this day, some asset management firms keep, keep these very, very separate, more so than, than I think almost any other industry. Thank you. So last question for, for the three of you before we turn it over to the audience for them to um, hopefully grill you on some of these topics. We'd love to understand, given the challenges we've discussed, right? Data governance, it, building a data culture, the talent piece, the fact that this is costly. Um, what's your call to action for people on the call who either want to start applying machine learning or want to scale their effort enterprise-wide? What are your, your words of wisdom, Ari, or, Ari, or your lessons learned here? Sure. Um, again, I think it's a long list, but I'll, I'll try to distill it down to, to one or two. Um, I think you can almost separate if you're really if you're on the beginning and or early on in the journey, uh, as most of us are. Um, I think you really distill it down to, to two distinct pieces: the the sort of um, uh, identification of use cases, brainstorming of use cases, the, defining the right uh, business case uh, to get started on, and then the execution. Uh, for the first one, uh, I think that's all around developing, uh, making sure you have the right uh, internal resources, resource resources, uh, somebody dedicated to it, um, someone dedicated to what well, you want to call it advanced analytics, uh, AI, machine learning, data science, somebody in the organization with, with a relatively senior, um, uh, senior stature to be able to actually think about the entire organization where you could actually drive AI from a use case perspective. Um, and, and actually, you know, tie results to it. And then the execution piece, actually, I think the way to get started, and even for us as well, a lot of it was through partnerships. So thinking through um, how you could leverage the ecosystem. Actually, we have quite a strong ecosystem, both in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, um, where it's both, you know, universities, academia, we have, we have a, we're starting a partnership with um, a university. Actually, we've had a few. Um, with startups, there's a, several startups we've been working with uh, that have really niche expertise. Um, and then, you know, just general data science firms or, or, or um, uh, data science departments. I mean, it's not like you have at Deloitte. So uh, the idea is just find the right people that could help you or the right uh, call it entities that can help you execute. Uh, but you do need to start with the right use cases first. Yeah, for sure. And, and on that note, Ari, do you have a specific methodology or approach that you're using at PSP for prioritizing those? Can you walk us through the, the thinking there? Because it's a it's a key process, right? Selecting that right um, use case upfront, making sure you've got leadership alignment is critical as you've mentioned it all. Um, so what's your approach to it at PSP? 
Yeah. Uh, so again, it's it's uh, so we've got let's say four main criteria that we judge any use case on, and that that really does help prioritize. Uh, the first is it's got to have a large impact. It's got to be worth all the investment we're about to make. So large impact. I mean, we really mean it's got to move the, the needle. And so a PSP had a two hundred and fifty billion dollar fund. Uh, you know that that actually becomes quite a significance. We're talking about in the tens of millions of potential impact at least. Um, the second is uh, we'll need uh, sponsorship for it. So uh, from the from the investing class. So whether we're working with private equity or uh, real estate or, or public uh, public equities, we'll need a sort of the head of that business unit to fully sponsor it and actually dedicate a team along with us. So we need that commitment from whoever we're working with. Uh, the third would be experimentation. Uh, we want to make sure that it is experimental. If it's somewhat proven or uh, relatively, call it, uh, I don't want to say easy to execute, but others have, it, it's become kind of commonplace to execute a project like this, uh, then we probably shouldn't, shouldn't be spending uh, these types of resources on those projects. Um, and then the last is uh, it's got to be a reasonable cost because, again, these costs could easily skyrocket again into the tens of millions. If you have a multiple year project with, with 10 different people on it at, at really high, a lot of them are, are high cost um, and data gets expensive, too. So you just have to make sure it's all reasonable um, within it. And so once you actually put it through that four, those four at the other end of your funnel, it actually becomes quite narrow um, and, and it becomes pretty obvious where the right use cases are. Thanks, Sari, for those uh, concrete uh, concrete tips. Really enjoy that. Um, Alec, Jonathan, what are what's your call to action given everything we've discussed to date? Uh, as I, I'll echo a couple of things that Ari said. So on on the partnership side, for sure, I I, I think it is very very important for asset management companies to be very deliberate in terms of you know what they do in house, where they find the right partnerships. Um, as someone who kind of has, you know, a, a one foot in, in the academic world, right, and one foot in the startup world, I think it's also the the two can serve very, very different purposes, right? Academia can be very, very good in terms of, um, you know, understanding where there is an opportunity, right? You know, doing like sort of a high level study, but at the end of the day, because of sort of how students are incentivized, their ability to do something that's more engineering heavy can be very, very limited. Right. Um, and that, you know, that's where startups are doing something in house comes in. Um, and, you know, like certainly there, you know, there are certain things that kind of make sense for for me to do with the university. Right. And a lot of other things that make more more sense to do as a, as a startup. Right. Sort of depending on the scale of the of the collaboration for the most part. Um, and then the second thing is 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 funneling as well. So this is this is also echoing what Ari said, right? Like, you know, what what are the more creative applications? Right. Like what, it, you know, what is that thing around, you know, a very, you know, highly explored use case within you know quant equities right because that it's going to be much more difficult to move the needle there um and even beyond beyond the front office as well right I, I think because you know front office is core to the business and also because it's so interesting right a lot more attention gets um it gets a lot more attention in front of machine learning compared to you know middle office back office or even things like marketing where of course there's a, a ton of opportunity thanks alec Jonathan, your call to action for people on a call wanting to start or scale their machine learning efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not going to labor the point um, because I've uh, mentioned it twice now, but the point around culture is going to be critical. And there is an opportunity that everyone has as we uh, come up through the back of the pandemic into hybrid working. The hybrid working and making sure that data quality there is an opportunity for that to be, to be driven through the organization. Um, so I suggest people take advantage of that. Um, and then the other one, as, as we've mentioned, um, but it's be, be targeted and be purposeful. You could try to apply AI and machine learning in many places, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to, and that's okay. And it's also okay if some of your attempts at this fail, because you know where not to go. So you've got to, you've got to take the failures, but fail fast and move on. Um, and it's and having a robust way of determining where it does make sense. Um, and articulating the value that's expected and a way to track that so that when you get the questions around, should we be spending this budget? What value is it bringing? You can, it's, it's a very easily defensible position. Without that, articulating some of the benefits, they aren't always there um, and they can take time to see. So I think make sure you're setting yourself up for success before you um, embark on this journey. Well said, Jonathan, thank you for that. 
Um, want to encourage our participants again to uh, submit their questions uh, via the chat. Um, Aisha, if we can move on one or two slides, just wanted to share with the audience and we'll, we'll send those to you by email, a couple of resources where you can learn more, read more about um, the application of AI uh, in, the, in your space and in investment management, but also wanted to ask you if there are any recommendations of, uh, of podcasts, books, um, Ari, Alec, like, Jonathan, this this stuff moves really fast, right? Where where do you draw inspiration? Where do you um, exchange knowledge and ideas? What are your sources of information? Ari, where where do you keep up? How do you keep up? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I have anything. So I, I listen to it like a whole host of. So I guess I'm sitting both on the in investor and the and the the, yeah, the investor and the AI side, right? Trying to, we're, I guess our group is really trying to straddle um, straddle both. So I don't only just listen to AI podcasts. In fact, I sometimes um, uh, I try to find actually somewhere in the middle. Uh, so a few that do a really good job on uh, on those. Uh, A16Z uh, has a good podcast uh, that generally sometimes touches on these topics. Um, there's another one I'm blanking on right now uh, that also does a nice job. I, I can actually find it later. Maybe you could send it out, um, yeah. the, the name of it. Uh, they, they do a good job. And then otherwise, um, there's a ton of really good books, actually, as of recent, of the last like 10 years or so that have been written on um, uh, a lot of the Wall Street investment firms, what they've done on AI. And, and they'll never get too specific on specific trading strategies, but they will talk about how they've implemented and their ideas. Uh, again, I, I'm always blanking on the names, but there's one that really okay. recently came out on um, Renaissance Technologies, right? Jim Simmons, uh, it's a really good book. Uh, there's a few that's been written about, uh, generally about the quants on Wall Street and how that whole quant uh, uh, movement started. Uh, so again, bad with names, but those types of resources have been phenomenal and there's a ton of information in there. Sounds good. Catchy name with the Quants of Wall Street. Um, I like that one. Alec, Jonathan, any other recommendation, com complimentary recommendations for how to uh, to keep up, how to continue learning? Uh, talking about books, probably one of the ones you had you would have had in mind, Ari, would be Marcus Lopez de Prado's book, uh, so Machine Learning and Finance. Um, that's I, I suppose that's kind of the the Bible when when it comes to to Quant. And you know, interestingly, right, like in Marcus's book you won't find any deep learning stuff, but for the most part, you know, the way he talks about how to build quant models is, is very much still the state of the art. Uh, uh, Why Combinator Forums, um, so, so Hacker News is, is a great source where, where I kind of go to keep up with latest papers. I find that when it comes to papers, unfortunately, right now, I think the incentives are such that there is a lot of work that gets published in machine learning. Right, you know, moving the needle on some use cases, but I think for the most part, like for a paper to come in that's very, very transformative, is rare. Is rare. So I, I do keep up with papers, uh, but for the most part, it's just glancing through and saying, okay, like you know, they got half a point on you know some benchmark and they published in Europe, but this is not probably something that that I would use in my day to day. And also talking to folks, right, especially in in finance, in a lot of ways. Finance is also interesting because industry is ahead of academia in a lot, a lot of ways, right? So even someone, you know, like doing doing his graduate schooling now, um, there is a lot of things where I would rather talk to an industry practitioner than that an academic about. Fantastic, Jonathan, your suggestions, and then um, we'll collect feedback from our participants on uh, on uh, on on this webcast and other things we can do to help with uh, closing some knowledge gaps, Jonathan. What are sure. you reading or what do you encourage others to read or listen to? I love, I love Ari's suggestion of the podcast. Yes, yeah, so I, I think this depends where you are on generally your, your depth of knowledge already um, on these things. But I think when I was really starting to try to understand this and get into it, there were two particular books which gave me kind of what I consider to be my foundational knowledge. Um, so the first, first one of those was, um, and they're pretty, they're pretty literal titles. Um, so I don't think it's going to be any... Uh, plaudits for that but machine learning for for asset managers was definitely one um by marcus lopez de prado um and then and then the other one was artificial artificial intelligence for asset management and investment uh, a strategic perspective which gave a bit more of a business and long-term view from that super mukul i see i saw you coming on screen any 
and I know you're an avid reader. Anything to add? No, I was just going to say, you know, we've got a, a range of related materials on, on our Deloitte Insights. You can see some of that here, but also attending these webcasts regularly on a monthly basis, even if it is outside a, a direct topic of your interest. Uh, that is the purpose of, of bringing our, our business communities together is really cross-pollinating insights, trends, activities. Um, you can draw inspiration from industry leaders from any sector or segment. Uh, not just uh, in financial services or investment management. I find that oftentimes in our client conversations, that is really, really powerful to find out what's happening globally in different sectors and how that how they are evolving their applications and uh, operating models and business models through the use of AI and data. Thanks, Mukul. I appreciate that because that allows me to talk about our, our next webcast, which is actually on personalization with AI. And while... Uh, we expect to see a lot of um, participants from the consumer world. Um, I think that there, to your point, Mukul, there's cross-pollination uh, possible when you're trying to think about personalization, even of the employee experience, right? Uh, uh, not just the customer experience. Um, so that will be our, our event on October 27th. Feel free to, um, to register for that event. As you can see, we have um, a long list of topics that we're, we're trying to, uh, to cover uh, with this year. Um, but one of the things we, we want to hear from you is uh, how we did and, and how we can do better. Um, so Aisha, if we can share the, the link to the quick survey just for a question. Um, tell us how relevant this conversation was for you. Um, we we want to hear your, your perspective and, and improve, continue improving on our webcast series. So we'll give you a minute for the poll. Thank you, Aisha. Maybe I can take this opportunity, uh, Audrey, to really thank you and, and our panelists, Ari, Alec, and Jonathan, for uh, a fantastic session and sharing all your rich insights and experiences and, and um, suggestions to our, our audience. And Masi Dua, we thank you for all of you attendees for attending our AI Suit webcast today. So as you kindly fill out this final poll, we'd love to hear any other insights or feedback from you. And as Audrey mentioned, encourage you to check out all our upcoming podcasts that would be available on our website. And we'll leave the QR code after the panel poll uh, or this, this poll for you to take a quick snapshot of that and, and do join us again for upcoming webcasts. Fantastic. Thank you, Mukul. Yes, in terms of the poll, uh, choice one to 10, just think about them as ratings of one to 10, where one is poor or low and 10 is high or super. So if you can uh, give us your feedback using these ratings, we'll make sure that, to fix that for our next event. I echo Mukul's uh, thanks of our panelists, Ari, Alec, Jonathan, thank you so much for um, giving us some of your time, your thoughts, your ideas, and uh, your experience, which I'm sure is uh, uh, was learned from, from the trenches. Um, we look forward to continue the conversation. Um, and I for sure will talk to you in, uh, in October, and we'll talk about AI and personalization. I wish you an excellent afternoon. Um, bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Mukul. Thanks, all. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.